edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley reporting to you from Washington, D.C. It is the afternoon of Friday, September 4th, 2015. Uh, A jam-packed broadcast today, so let's get right to it. Much of the world's strategic situation currently revolves around the Iran nuclear accord. And on this front, there is some good news. Even the rotten Democratic Party seems to have gotten over, or they have reached, first of all, the 34 votes which are necessary to sustain a veto, meaning that if the reactionary Republicans pass a resolution condemning the Iran nuclear accord, that goes to Obama. Obama vetoes it. And at that point, you've got to have a two-thirds majority in both houses to sustain the veto. The Democrats have now reached 34 votes. That means they can sustain the veto. If all of those people hold on, which is an if, this uh, deal is going to go through. Now, it's not just 34. As of this morning, we are told that there are 37 votes in the Senate in favor of the Iran nuclear accord, come what may. Now, this could then grow to the 41 which are necessary to prevent debate. In other words, prevent this odious Republican tactic from uh, getting onto the floor. In other words, they'll never be able to pass the condemnation resolution, the abrogation resolution, if the Democrats get to 41. And there's some uh, possibility that the Democrats might indeed muster these 41 votes. Remember what's at stake here. A a, a vote against the Iran nuclear deal is a vote for war. And you know those oligarchs, right, those despicable politicians, stupid, corrupt, cruel as they are, They're not going to have their kids in that war. They're not going. It's going to be your kids. And Iran, take a look at it. It's four or four or five times bigger than Iraq in terms of land mass. It's three to four times bigger in population. So think about what that would mean. Piece of absolute insanity leading to the breakdown of the United States, guaranteeing Chinese world domination. So the survivors would be taking orders in Chinese. Is that the future you want? Well, if so, then you you better vote Republican, because that's what that is. So 37 so far. Now, tactics have changed. The Israeli ambassador is reported to be on the Hill a great deal, Capitol Hill, the Congress, and the Israeli ambassador is telling the Republicans, don't focus on the deal per se. Don't focus on the merits or demerits of the Iran nuclear accord. (laughs) Of course not, because it has more stringent inspection procedures than the arms control treaties of the 1980s. You remember SALT, strategic arms limitation talks, START, strategic arms reduction talks, uh, uh, intermediate nuclear forces, INF in Europe. All of those were nuclear accords with a very powerful country, USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, a big deal. But even then, with measures that were less intrusive, these deals were passed. And the idea was that, of course, the Soviet nuclear forces were an existential threat, could have destroyed the United States. But now we're being told that a superior level of supervision and uh, verification. That's not enough anymore. (laughs) Why? I don't know. Uh, There's no reason for it. Uh, If you could make a deal with the Soviets at a lesser degree of verification, you can certainly make a deal with Iran today, which is far from posing any existential threat whatsoever to the United States, has not invaded anybody. Uh, I just happened to hear an absolutely ridiculous program this morning on national public uh, radio. It was something called America Abroad. These are warmongers. Don't listen to them. America Abroad. And they assume, they say, well, there's an Iran program for nuclear weapons. Not even that is proven. Dear bozos, dear reactionaries. National Pentagon Radio strikes again. And I think there are even people in the Pentagon who are better than that. Now, we also know uh, on the other side 
that the ambassadors of Germany and Russia and France and Europeans in general have been going to Capitol Hill saying, look, you are you better not kid yourself. If your essentially stupid gang of Tea Party louts and cretins, if they decide to torpedo this deal, you think that we, Britain, France, Germany, Russia, Japan, you think we're going to sabotage our own great business prospect with Iran? Well, you better guess again. So you can't go back on this. Uh, it's, it might even be possible if you pass the deal and then Iran were found to be cheating, there might be a way to restore some sanctions. But I don't even think that. But certainly, if these yahoos, right, the people in the U.S. Congress uh, torpedo the deal, then the world is going to say, look, guys, we've had enough of this farce. We're told that Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee, he's a real corker, has uh, put out a message to his constituents saying, well, <laughs> looks like we've lost this one. We better find uh, something else to do. Now, um, we're also told that there are various desperate stratagems within the narrow framework of the Iran nuclear accord. For example, we're told that Netanyahu wants to sabotage, Netanyahu, prime minister of Israel, of course, wants to sabotage the Iran nuclear accord by adding poison pill riders. Uh, these used to be called killer amendments, killer amendments. So we're told that people like Cory Booker of New Jersey and Mark Warner of Virginia, these are two right-wing Democrats, okay? They want to add some kind of killer amendment that will make it impossible to, uh, to go forward. I don't think they have... Uh, much of a chance of doing that, because this thing is not going to get to debate in the Senate. There will be no way to do it. We also have Netanyahu himself taking evasive action by proposing a new round of talks with the Palestinians. These would be the first since, uh, what, April of 2014, when the previous round of talks broke down. I can't imagine how anybody in his right mind would negotiate with Netanyahu simply because Netanyahu has proven that he does not negotiate in good faith. It is a fool's errand. It is a wild goose chase. Get Netanyahu out of there, then it might, uh, might go somewhere, but not with Netanyahu. Now, what we're then seeing is <laughs> the war party uh, playing on their mighty Wurlitzer of, uh, of warmonger propaganda. These characters are now... Uh, shifting. And here's the idea. I had this in one of the briefings of this week. I already detected this, uh, this uh, tendency. Neocon writers are tending to drop the whole issue of the Iran nuclear accord and focus on starting a war with Syria. And here, of course, our dear friend, ISIS czar John Allen, whatever anybody thinks, he is in the middle of it. He is the leading edge. You want to have thermonuclear war? Well, then ignore John Allen, because he is the guy who's bringing that closer and closer. Remember, Russia has personnel on the ground, Russian Syrian military commission, Russian advisors, Russian technicians, Russian communications. And at this point, probably some police, MPs, military police or something like that. And there may soon be more. There may be a peacekeeping force from the Collective Security Treaty Organization, CSTO, which is the uh, military uh, union, the military uh, alliance of some of the post-Soviet states, not all. But here's the idea. The little boy, the toddler in the red T-shirt, lying on the Turkish beach, is now the image for these neocon vultures to start a general war. And we'll tell you that in just a minute. All right, the Iran nuclear accord probably has enough votes, certainly enough votes to be, uh, to eventually go into effect, and quite possibly enough votes so that it won't even be rejected, uh, which is what little Rand Paul 
was saying the other day. He said, oh, well, watch out. You know, some of those 34 Democratic votes, they, they may get shaken loose and dislodged when we Republicans go through our warmonger exercise. Man, oh, man, little Rand is kissing goodbye to his base of dupes because not even the most duped of all the dupes could imagine that he is an anti-interventionist, anti-militarist at this point. Little Rand is a complete opportunist from the Southern Jurisdiction Scottish Rite Freemasonic uh, organization. And his, I think he's at between 1% and 2% in the polls. That's well-deserved. And I, uh, I've heard that CNN is doctoring the rules in the next debate to get Little Rand into the uh, the upscale uh, group, right, the top of the uh, of the ticket there, uh, that just shows that Little Rand, far from being an anti-establishment figure, is just another cheek, if you will, of the establishment. So the Iran nuclear deal seems like it's going to go through. The desperate warmonger party, the neocon fascist madmen, neocon vultures, neocon reactionaries, and some humanitarian bomber allies, uh, they're going into this other mode now, which is the Syrian humanitarian crisis. And it is this tragic picture of the little boy in the red T-shirt lying face down in the surf on a Turkish beach. Uh, for example, Michael Gerson, Gerson, today, Washington Post, September 4th, 2015, that this picture represents the massive collective security failure of incredible proportions. It is a pantomime of outrage, says Frederick Hof, former special advisor for transition in Syria. Um, look, uh, this is the most cynical operation uh, in a while, at least. Uh, here's what we got. Uh, the sidekick of Allen, McGurk, went on television last uh, Sunday. This is Ambassador McGurk with his scabrous and uh, satiric, satiric uh, past. So McGurk goes on there and he actually says the opposite of what Allen had said a month before. You remember that when Allen was at the, ISIS, the uh, Aspen Forum at the end of July, Allen was triumphalistic. He said, we're beating ISIS. We're smashing them. They're on the run. ISIS is losing and we are winning. Now McGurk says the opposite. One month later, who could believe these guys? Fire them both. Uh, just based on this, right, that they give such different reports with 30 days in between. So McGurk says, oh, no, this is going to be a long twilight struggle. This is going to take forever. This is a real tough cookie. Man, ISIS, they are formidable. They are 10 feet tall. They have magical powers. We can't stop them. Well, the Kurds, the Kurds defeat them routinely. And if you close the Syrian-Turkish border, you cut them off at the knees. That's the end of them. Their logistics will be gone, their supply lines cut, and they will scatter in all directions, and a lot of them won't make it. So that's McGurk. But now, Rubin, this woman, Jennifer Rubin, the right-turn columnist of the Washington Post, then says, oh, look at this. This is terrible. This is a capitulation. She says, any serious Republican presidential candidate has to be in favor not only of bombing Syria, but of sending in the Marines, sending in the infantry, sending in the heavy divisions, the tanks and so forth. Now, this Rubin, in case you don't know her, uh, she is so discredited. She has lied and fabricated stories so many times that the Washington Post ombudsman, sort of in-house watchdog that they have on the Scandinavian model, as he left – he left a memo saying the Washington Post should fire Jennifer Rubin. Uh, the uh, editorial page editor, Fred Hyatt, then ignored that. But the idea here is that she's unethical, and even people in her own protect, uh, profession are against her. But she, just like Rand Paul, sometimes she's got that Freemasonic backup, so she nobody touches her. Now, uh, I think you get the idea. You're going to see more and more about the humanitarian emergency, and this is pure hypocrisy because they're talking about bombing Assad, letting ISIS take over the country, and the humanitarian emergency will go through the roof. I put out uh, this past week, I recommend you look at it. It's in one of the morning briefings. You can get it at tarpley.net. I put out 
an approach to solving the refugee crisis. The first item is no more bombing, no more Libya, no more destroying governments, no more terrorists taking over. Don't allow it. Work with existing governments. Make up your mind you're going to work with Assad. 